back, uh, and we're actually going to get into lecture material this time uh, after our brief introduction on kind of the structure of our course. So for MEC 202, again, for uh, polymers and composite materials, uh, essentially polymer physics. Uh, so just a quick note about my uh, lecture note format. Um, there'll be kind of some key terms, definitions. Again, these are not comprehensive, but just to give kind of a quick highlight um, in terms of some key terms you need to know for each lecture, uh, we'll hit each of these uh, as we go along. So again, just to kind of give you a roadmap of what to expect to see. So uh, in this course, not surprisingly, as I mentioned many, many, many times, uh, <laughs> we are going to be studying uh, polymers. And really, um, we're going to get a little bit more specific and we're going to uh, actually study soft matter. So soft matter is a kind of a broader term um, for the study of polymeric materials, um, because soft materials, we're going to classify uh, that in just a second, it, it includes polymers, it can include nanoparticles, uh, organic and organic hybrid systems, so um, these actually are my field of uh, research. So I study um, basically systems where, for example, you have uh, cells, you're going to see my poor drawing, cells running around uh, doing random walks, or you have uh, basically a sperm cell uh, kind of migrating towards uh, an egg here. So migrating towards to fertilize an egg. I build basically synthetic systems uh, where I model cells using these rolling uh, magnetic particles. So you apply a magnetic field here, they roll on the surface, and they try to mimic essentially these really unique and ubiquitous uh, actions of your kind of non-equilibrium uh, biological system of interest. But anyways, uh, this also is uh, included in kind of the soft matter realm of what we're going to be talking about today. Colloids, so small particles, uh, usually on the micrometer length scales, uh, liquid crystals, uh, and so, and uh, it's particularly relevant, soft matter can be applied to a lot uh, in most biological systems, uh, as most biological systems are composed of soft matter. So, this is going to be really, really useful, again, for you bioengineers out there. Again, here's my rant about biology is that a lot of, you know, protein behavior, um, proteins can be um, a model as polymers. Uh, cells, uh, for the most part, can be modeled uh, as polymers or vesicles as well. So uh, most of the theories and the fundamental, like, principles and insights that we're going to be talking about in this class, uh, a lot of the general behavior that we're going to be focusing on, specifically for polymers, can be applicable more widely to biological systems as well. It could be muscle cells, mitochondria, or not mitochondria, but um, uh, the myosin kinesin motor system. Uh, that is all kind of covered in this realm of kind of soft matter uh, systems. So um, another thing that I want to focus on, um, and one of the beautiful things about soft matter is uh, we are concerned in this class about a couple of things that make, I think, it unique. So we are concerned about length scales, We're concerned about scaling behavior. And we are concerned about order of magnitude changes. So I'm going to elaborate on this in just a second. So the beautiful thing about soft matter is we are, as you're going to see in this course, we are going to build up. We are going to go to the, from the starting really, really small to the angstrom level, so 10 minus 10 meters. We are going to uh, look and talk about aspects or theory or polymerization where we're dealing at angstrom level um, length scales, uh, so 10 to the minus 10 and probably even smaller, we're going to look at behavior at the nanometer length scales, so 10 to the minus 9. We are going to look at behavior of polymers and how it changes at the micrometer length scales, so to the minus 6, all the way to the millimeter, minus 3, and then sometimes even, one more m, to the meter length scale. So what I'm kind of trying to say here is, again, Polymers are so unique because we can investigate and see different properties across 10 orders of magnitude. That is a tremendous change. Uh, usually when you're studying something, you're always focused on one length scale, but polymers exhibit really unique and very, very different behavior uh, and soft matter in general across multiple length scales. So it's kind of this hierarchical structure. Uh, it's really uh, amazing to kind of uh, that we'll be studying all these different length scales. Um, so that's kind of the one unique aspect about how do you deal with or how you're studying soft matter uh, and materials in general. In this class in particular, I kind of mentioned that I don't care about math uh, and getting that final answer, and that's extremely true because when we're dealing with polymers, we want to see how does a particular behavior scale. So, for example, um, we are going to be looking at uh, basically the structure of polymers. 
This is my favorite polymer, polyethylene. You definitely have this probably in your trash can right now. Uh, we want to see, for example, how does, you know, this n is like the number of repeat units. How does this n scale? So what is kind of our scaling parameter here? What is our alpha? Is alpha, is it 1? Is it 2? Is it 0 0.5? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I do not care, and we do not care about materials uh, as polymer physicists, what is kind of this pre-factor here, A, the multiplicative factor. We care about scaling parameters here. How does this behavior scale? What are the trends? How does it scale? Um, because this, we are always going to be, we're going to see a lot of these power laws pop up. This alpha is going to change the behavior much, much more because it's essentially, you know, it's again, it's a power law relationship as opposed to this kind of multiplicative inner, uh, uh, basically multiplicative relationship. So uh, I do not care about this. We do not care about this. We care about how does our behavior scale because that's going to lead to our larger changes. And this brings me to my bigger point. In material science, as polymer physicists in general, we care about how behavior changes, whether it's Young's modulus, uh, whether it's uh, essentially your viscosity, uh, whether it is um, your glass transition temperature, although that's not going to change uh, by an order of magnitude. Um, uh, it could be your TM. You're looking at how do these kind of critical material properties, how does this change your diffusivity? That's a big one. Um, how, does, how do these properties change uh, and we're looking at, we're interested in changes that are order of magnitude changes. We don't care about 10% or 20% or 15% changes. These are meaningless changes to us. If you're interested in those changes, those are important changes in photovoltaics. Uh, so um, I don't want to minimize that, but for polymer physics, for soft matter, we're looking at order of magnitude changes. So 10 time changes. That's what we're interested in. That's the behavior that gets us excited. So. Uh, that's just kind of a, uh, a, you know, you probably have not seen that, or of course has probably has not focused too much on that uh, previously. So I just wanted to kind of, that's our kind of overriding framework, our fundamental philosophy for uh, this course. So let's talk a little bit of brief history and motivation about why should we should even study soft matter. Why should we study polymers? These kind of really unique, um, basically not, I want to say motile, but reconfigurable dynamic uh, materials. Um, so, not surprisingly, polymers and soft matter are extremely ubiquitous, uh, even the naturally occurring ones. Uh, but one of the first kind of ways that you, uh, people, uh, the kind of the history of polymers uh, is brought up is uh, when you think about rubber. So, rubber, most of you probably, hopefully, maybe you've heard this story about Charles Goodyear. So, the Goodyear tire, so rubber is actually natural rubber that's found uh, uh, basically from the rubber tree. It is really, really viscous. Uh, it's very, you know, it's not, um, it doesn't have much of an elastic component to it, so it flows. Natural rubber. Charles Goodyear creates the tires. It's a tire, more like a donut, Krispy Kremes, I'm hungry. Uh, Charles Goodyear, the story goes that uh, in his lab, he was working with natural rubber, so this kind of viscous flowing rubber. Uh, also, uh, sorry, quick side note, Please buy uh, Silly Putty. Silly Putty is critical for this course. You could model anything. Anything in soft matter can be modeled, or any concept can be uh, visualized with using Silly Putty. And so I'll, I'll be bringing mine out uh, pretty soon. Uh, so the story goes that um, Charles Goodyear was working with this kind of natural rubber in lab, and then accidentally somehow uh, poured or sulfur. Sulfur got poured into kind of the mixture, and this created kind of these chemical crosslinks. So this is. Polymers are you kind of usually describe again like this linear polymer or these kind of random coils. But if we had these kind of two linear polymers, the sulfur created these disulfide crosslinked bridges. So chemically crosslinked, and this made the rubber, which is initially very like flowing and viscous and fluidy, much more elastic. Um, uh, yeah, behave much more elastically, almost like a solid, and that's kind of what allowed uh, Goodyear to kind of create rubber tires. So he took credit for this sulfur. Um, for this, uh, basically, this is called crosslinking or chemical crosslinking. So he took uh, credit. Uh, actually, it's called vulcanization for sulfur. Vulcanizing rubber. But uh, it was actually the Ma ancient Mayan civilizations when they looked back, uh, basically at the kind of those uh, when they played uh, with those kind of rubber balls. Uh, like kind of the first instances of sports, those rubber balls were made from this rubber tree, and they actually cross-linked. Uh, there's an interesting paper written by um, 
uh, one of my lab instructors as an undergraduate, and he helped to kind of prove this. That it's actually published in Science uh, to prove that it was these ancient Mayan civilizations. They looked back at some samples, and they actually were cross-linking them uh, way back then. So um, really, really, really uh, kind of cool. And speaking of some colleagues, uh, one of the really fun parts also about um, kind of polymer physics in general is we're going to learn from some really, really unique and amazing uh, uh, people. So this uh, is uh, Rubenstein, excuse me, right here. He uh, actually wrote our textbook, the optional textbook. Uh, so we're going to be talking, um, using a lot of kind of the theories that he helped to develop. Uh, this is Dejen. Uh, he's kind of a really fun, uh, kind of crazy guy. We'll kind of come uh, and talk uh, talk about him a little bit more later. Uh, he has an interesting history, different, really unique personality, uh, to say the least. Uh, so he's a really, really, really uh, kind of fun guy to talk to. Um, so well, there's lots of kind of people, uh, kind of pillars in the uh, polymer physics and soft matter community uh, that we'll be learning a lot from, learning a lot about uh, kind of their history, how they develop these theories. Um, we have some Flory Huggins. Paul Flory is really important. Uh, we'll come back in a second. There's some really, really unique research. And there's some newer people in the field uh, as well. Um, so I actually met uh, him. And he does some really unique work with, uh, uh, basically, he uses these silicon nanoparticles to, uh, basically, silicon nanoparticles as sutures. So you don't have to have, like, kind of complex sutures. It's almost like this glue that you just paste on, and then the patient's uh, wounds are basically already sealed. It's, it's unbelievable. It's just water and silicon nanoparticles. Super simple, uh, really complex. It's called vitrimers, if anyone's interested. I had lunch with him. He was a very, very kind, uh, very, very smart person. Anyways, uh, but uh, there's kind of newer uh, kind of uh, pillars in the soft matter community. Uh, soft matter community. So uh, I know several of these people. So these two are my uh, group mates. In my PhD, uh, he studies these gold nanoparticles uh, that are functionalized, and they can be used to uh, basically penetrate a lipid bilayer. So if you have a lipid bilayer, these nanoparticles can insert and then deliver drugs. Uh, Charles Singh, he does a lot of simulation work on uh, basically many, 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 many different topics. Uh, so polymer gels, uh, charge gels, uh, he is very, very prolific. Um, this is my advisor, Alfredo Alexander Katz. We'll hear a lot more about him later. Katz. Um, so he's done a lot, a lot of different work uh, in various fields as well. Uh, this is uh, Sharon Glotzer. And so she does a lot of uh, unique work at the University of Michigan in the uh, active matter field. Again, very prolific researcher Monica Oliveira Cruz but again there's lots of kind of uh, we'll see lots of unique and very very distinct and different research and so um, and it's nice to kind of see the kind of the newer um, who's going to be leading this field uh, for many decades and years to come so one of the great things about material science uh, and polymers uh, and being a material scientist is that when you look back at history um, ages are defined by materials so we've lived through the Iron Age the Bronze Age porcelain, ceramic age, steel age, these are all materials. But now we are in the silicon and we are in the polymer uh, or the information age. Um, so that is, again, my just pitch to become a material scientist as, you know, as opposed to any other uh, major. So we are in the age now where polymers are the dominant uh, material. So why are polymers becoming extremely attractive and why are they dominating, you know, the, why are they the dominant material of choice? Um, well, polymers will typically, and it's interesting because they have a much lower Young's modulus than either metals or ceramics, strength, uh, temperature use range, poor conductors, electricity, heat. Why are we using these materials? Well, uh, they are dynamical. So they are fluctuating and reconfiguring bonds. Uh, this can give rise to kind of some really interesting, amazing self-healing behavior. We'll talk more about that. But in terms of mechanics, you know, you see kind of the deficit here. Like, why are we using these polymers and these different materials? Well, the answer, as all, um, unfortunately or fortunately, whatever you, however you want to think about it, uh, comes to economics. So Michael Ashby um, made this software. Uh, it's amazing software. Unfortunately, it's extremely, extremely expensive. The license, I think it's like $100,000. But these are called uh, Ashby plots. So 
These plots allow you to use a log-log plot for different parameters. So this is the density of your material versus the strength. Unfortunately, this doesn't say UTS. I'm going to assume it's UTS. So this is the strength of the material versus the density log-log. What are we noticing here uh, in terms of the material? So foams, uh, you see at the very, very you know, top here, you have your ceramics. Uh, and then you have some metals here on the side. But you start to get into kind of this range right here where polymers, interestingly and amazingly, uh, are starting to kind of exhibit at much order of magnitude lower density, similar if not superior uh, strength compared to your ceramics uh, and even your metals. So think about this, an order of magnitude less density. So if you look from here to here, one order of magnitude less dense, similar strength, and really probably even for your ceramics, less than an order of magnitude difference. So you have an order of magnitude less dense, similar strength. What Now we can kind of see why are, why are polymers being utilized here in terms of economics. Let's think about aerospace. For planes, what is the big, you know, aside from packing more people onto planes, what's the big cost for airplanes? Fuel, right? We are always pushing to make airplanes, uh, cars, we need to make them lighter to reduce our fuel cost. So we need to, if we could substitute for metals for a material that is an order of magnitude less dense, but with similar mechanical properties, or, you know, even again, it could be a little bit, uh, you know, poor, you know, mechanical properties. As long as it can survive in that application, if it's an order matching less dense, we're going to save a lot in terms of your fuel. So this is why, and then you kind of see composites here. We're going to talk more about that later. Composites are a real sweet spot right here. So you're at the same, if not better, and again, still a little bit shifted. So composites also fall into the soft matter and polymer range. So that is kind of the big driving force here. There's a big drive in industry to redesign and rethink how can we replace kind of the traditional materials that we've utilized, whether it be in cars, airplanes, et cetera. How can we replace them with either composite materials or polymeric materials uh, so that we can save fuel. They're cheaper to produce, much, much cheaper to produce. Metals are really, really difficult uh, and uh, dif uh, difficult to produce, a lot of energy intensive. And polymers can also be easily, they're formable, don't need high temperatures to work with. There's lots and lots and lots of benefits, clear benefits to replacing essentially uh, or substituting in polymeric materials uh, uh, for metal materials because of this high strength to density ratio. That's kind of the, the new key parameter. So we want to look at S as a function of density. Whatever has the highest density, whatever this ratio, if it's higher, that's the winner. So that is what we want for our new aerospace electric vehicle application. So, uh, that's kind of the practical application. That's a, one of the big driving force. The other thing is polymers are just, they can use your class. They do things that metals and ceramics could never dream of doing. Uh, be, and we're going to see in the next lecture, in the next video, why that is. And that is because of their uh, structure, again, moving from this angstrom length scale all the way to the meter length scale. Uh, so it's due to bonding. Again, don't worry too much. We're not chemists. But I'm going to just give you enough chemistry to be a little bit dangerous. Uh, so... The reason, you know, it, these materials are dynamic and they can uh, do these really, really unique behavior is all due to kind of these intramolecular bonds. So we'll get into that next time. And yeah, I will talk to you later. Bye.